Hi, this is Greg from Structural Toolkit, and in this video we're going to be going through analysis features you get with the Structural Toolkit Analysis Standard version. For an overview of the basics of analysis, have a look at our Analysis Lite video. Analysis Standard gives you essentially unlimited nodes, access to 3D, and a variety of additional features to assist with your analysis models. In this video, we'll go through the following features. Wizard, which offers a quick way to set up a variety of model types from multi-span beams to frames and trusses. Second order analysis, which gives a more accurate method of analyzing, particularly useful for slender frames or models with large deflections. Shape editor, which allows the user to edit member sections in detail and overlay multiple shapes to achieve the desired section. Result points, which give the ability to show results on a model at a point without needing to add a node. And finally groups, which allows the user to create groups with members and nodes, which allow for the display for smaller and less congested result sets. Have a look at the timestamps on the screen if you want to skip to any section. An extremely useful feature that comes with analysis standard is wizard. This can be either accessed on the main desktop at the bottom left or from the document tab at the top. Opening up wizard, gives us an interface from which we can decide what kind of model we want to make. For this video, we'll go through two examples, one of a multi-span propped cantilever and then a portal frame. So for the first example, we technically could choose any of these top four, as it will bring up the same input screen just with some already filled out values for the original case chosen, which we will see shortly. In this case, I'll just pick the third one as that is close to what we're going to be doing. So in the beam wizard, we input each of our spans as a row in the table. To the right, we can designate either the left or right span to be a cantilever. Down below, we can specify the member size, giving us options for either timber or steel. And finally, we get an option to include a wind case in the default loads that will be on the beam. For our project beam, we'll set the cantilever to be on the left with a span of one meter. We'll have a second span be three meters. Now that a quick way to enter one span up to another is to either press enter or tab like I'm doing. We'll then do another span of 2 meters and then a final span of 1.5 meters. For our beam, we'll pick a 200 PFC. We'll also put the wind case on and leave the serviceability to ultimate ratio as 0.68. This will be used as a combination case to show wind deflection under serviceability loads. We'll then click OK. Toolkit will then generate the spans as we specified and then give us a set of default UDLs and point loads in each span for each load case, as we can see by turning them all on. What we can then do is delete and edit the loads as we need, or even add more through the load definitions menu. This could range from simply altering the number in the box, or turning a point load into a reaction from an already existing beam design using this button here. The combinations generated will reflect the standard loading combinations that are likely relevant and also include a wind serviceability combination that can be used for deflection. The second wizard type we'll look at is the portal wizard. So we'll go back to the desktop, open up wizard. For example, we'll just create a simple haunch portal frame. But as with the beam wizard, we can start with any of the portal options here to reach that option. It just affects the default starting inputs. So if we open the portal horn train, we get an interface that's a bit more in depth than the beam wizard, as there's a lot more going on with the frame. Some of the options are grayed out as they aren't relevant to the type of portal we are doing. To switch between types, we can use the options down the bottom right. And you can see that different options are appearing. Some are grayed out, some aren't. But for us, we'll just keep it with the standard. So firstly, the geometry gives us a few parameters to work with. We can change the span and eave height of the portal. Then we can have the ridge be based on either a height or a pitch input by setting the pitch option off or on. We can have a recessed column base, which will lower the bottom nodes of the frame below the zero coordinate of the y-axis, effectively making your portal column a bit longer. The outside dimensions tick box will have the geometry of the frame's height and span be based on the external sides of the member rather than center to center. Further below, we can specify the haunch length and at the bottom, we can specify spacing of adjacent bays along with purling continuity. This will be used for the loads that are defaulted onto the frame. 
Next are the member sections for each aspect of the frame, being the column, rafter, and haunch. This function is the same as the beam we chose for the other wizard, so we'll just leave it as the default. Finally, we have the loads, which gives us a few inputs for dead loads and also an option to ask for wind loads. This option, if ticked, will bring up a secondary interface that deals with all the wind load cases typically used for a pull to frame. To demonstrate this, we'll leave it on. To proceed to the next interface, we'll click OK. In this interface, we get several inputs ranging from pressure values and external and internal coefficients for wind. The first thing we need to decide is which direction of wind is acting on the left side of our pull to frame, being direction 1, which we can see on the image below. For our example, we'll pick west. This will then arrange the direction pressure inputs accordingly. We can then input our wind pressures and ratio from our wind analysis, which can be calculated from the wind loads module on the desktop. Next is the external coefficients for directions 3 and 4, which can be manually input or automatically calculated based on the number of spans and which portal bay within those spans is being used in the model. This is where those adjacent bay distances that we input in the first interface come into play. So for example, if we have five spans and we want to use the third internal bay, we'll have them set as five and three. You'll notice that the values in the input boxes have now been automatically calculated to reflect that chosen bay's portal. Should note that the directions one and two coefficients are calculated automatically based on geometry of the model that we put in the first interface. And we'll see that as UDLs on the model when we get to the actual analysis. Finally, we can edit the eternal coefficients as needed. In this case, I'll just leave them as default. Once done, we can click OK. As the load area on our frame is greater than 200 meters squared, note one from table 3.2 from 1170.1 .1 comes into play. And will ask us if you want to apply the 0.25 kPa load on only the center portion of the rafter. We'll click yes in this case. This will then generate this frame as we specified, along with all the relevant load cases, which is quite a few given the complexity of wind loading. The load cases will deal with all directions and relevant upper and lower bounds of wind coefficients. There is a lot going on here, so it is a good idea to familiarize yourself with all the load cases and combinations. Some of them are fairly self-explanatory, but to help with this, many of the values used in this model are based on defined variables. For example, if we look at one of the load definitions, we can see that this load is based on the roof dead load, centers, and a continuity variable. If we then look at the variables interface up here, we can find this roof dead load with its description and value. We could then change this value along with all others if needed, which would come through in the loading applied to the model. This gives us a significant amount of flexibility with modifying the loadings on the fly, even after you've applied the wizard. Just for reference, we'll show how the wind loads have been applied as UDLs across the entire span for those directions one and two. As we can see from the west wind that we've got as a load case, we have the UDL that steps as you go along the portal frame. Another useful analysis standard feature is the ability to use second order analysis, which can be found in the drop down under linear analysis. This feature would typically be used for models where you're dealing with very slender members or large deflections. For these kinds of models, it is useful to capture the secondary moment effects due to the deflected members. To show this in practice, we'll open up one of the second order examples from the desktop. In our case, we'll just pick the cantilever. Here we have two fixed cantilevers, each with a 10 kN point load. The only difference between the two models is that the cantilever on the right has more nodes than the cantilever on the left. If we were to linearly analyze these two models, we should get the same deflections and moments. So yep, we get the same moments, and if we turn the deflections on, we can see the same deflections as well. However, if I were to now apply second order direct analysis by using the drop down, second order direct, we will see slightly different answers. This is because with only two nodes, 
The analysis for the left cantilever fails to take into account the curvature within the deflected member when determining the second order effects. So although the cantilever on the left does account for second order effects to some extent, it isn't generally going to be as accurate as the model on the right, which contains three extra nodes. Typically speaking, the more nodes present, the closer the analysis should converge to the exact answer. This does mean that there will be some instances where if too few nodes are used, performing a second order analysis will have no effect. Another way to customize how the second order analysis is performed is through the advanced options, which can be found in the advanced part of the dropdown. In here, we can set a number of max iterations performed as the analysis tries to converge on the answer. And we can also set the analysis as a stepped second order, which will gradually add the 10 kN load on our modules as the deflections are calculated. If needed, these can also be applied in unison. To show this in practice, we'll have 10 steps with 10 max iterations each. And we'll go analyze. The results of this are slightly different again to our original second order. By stepping the load and iterating at the same time, we would expect this answer to probably be the most accurate out of all the others we've done. There is a balance to this, however, as you can see, even with such large deflections, the actual difference is relatively minor. And it's the same case when you compare these values against the linear analysis we did. Although further accuracy can be achieved with more nodes and iterations, it all requires more computing power and time. Another thing to note that the analysis convergence to the actual answer isn't a linear process. So there may be certain cases where an extra node without enough iterations could result in an answer further away than without having that extra node in the first place. With all this said, this feature is a very powerful tool, but it's up to the engineer's judgment on where it is necessary and to what extent of complexity is required. And so it is important to understand the fundamentals of second order analysis before using it. The next thing we'll look at is the shape editor. If we used our propped beam we made before, we can actually edit the member section used to be something more complex than what the steel library has to offer. To do this, we'll open up the sections menu. In here, we can see the 200 PFC we originally specified. We'll then convert the current profile to a custom shape to allow it to be edited by clicking the shape editor at the bottom and going convert. This will bring up an interface where you can see our shape on the top right and then a variety of inputs and data throughout the rest of the interface. The first way that we could edit our shape is by simply editing the coordinate points on the model table over here. For example, if we had our second point be 60.3 instead of 50.3, you'll notice that our model changes in accordance with that in the form of an orange outline. Something to remember whenever changing a model shape is when you're done editing the section, make sure the model shape central is correctly aligned with the axis by clicking this button down here. Another way we could edit this model is by adding another shape to it, such as an infill plate between the flanges. Before we do this, we'll put our model back to the way it originally was. So to do this, we click the add new shape button up the top. We'll select the input to be a shape and then have the profile be a rectangle. In order to fit the plate between the flanges of our 200 PFC, we'll need to make sure we get the depth right. So for our 200 PFC, we'll need to take off the flange thickness twice, being 12 mil. So that should give us a depth of 176. We'll then have the width of our plate be 10 mil. And go accept. We can now see that plate on our model space, but we still need to move it. So we know that the centroid of a 200 PFC from the outer flange outstands inwards is about 50.3 millimeters. So to move our plate to the edge of the flanges, we need to move it by 50.3 minus half of our infill plate's thickness, which is 45.3 millimeters. We can do this down in the bottom right by inputting 45.3 into the X coordinate and selecting move current subshape relative. As we can see, the infill plate fits nicely between the flanges. What we can do now is move the centroid. One more thing that we might need to consider is if we were going to use this member for torsion. 
As the torsion and warping constant don't have a prescribed formula that deals with all different shapes, we will instead need to approximate it with a shape of which we can calculate these values. At the moment our approximate shape is just a PFC as we can see by the red outline. But now with our infill plate, a better shape to use would be an RHS. To do this we'll select an RHS profile on the bottom left, which is within the torsion section. We then keep the depth and breadth the same, as this still matches up with our PSC geometry, but reduce our thickness slightly so that we don't overestimate its torsional stiffness. In this case, a value of 8mm would probably do the job. With that done, we can click apply and it will now be reflected on our model. To get a clear look of that, we'll zoom in on the side and rotate it. Another analysis standard feature is result points. These can be added anywhere along a member and allow for the display of a result without the need to add in another node. To show this in practice, we'll just use our propped beam again. Just so that things are a bit clearer, I'll turn off all the load cases that we've been looking at. So to add a result point in, we can click on a member, right click it, member selection, result points, and go edit. In here we can add a result point on the member as a percentage location from one end or as a distance, which we can see through this drop down here. The point itself can be visually displayed on multiple sides using these checkboxes. Do note that this doesn't affect any of the values in any way. As a whole, this interface functions in a very similar way to most other analysis interfaces. For example, we'll add a result point at 25% of the way along the span and click add. We can see now that we've got a result point down here. As we have the top and bottom checkboxes ticked, that's how visually we'll see those points on the beam. So if we now analyze our member by pressing F5, you can see here that we see the moment is displayed as a value at this point. We could then add multiple result points all along the span and it would do the exact same thing. Something like this is particularly useful when designing portal frames. And if we have a look at our portal frame wizard that we did earlier, you'll note that they already have result points there as a default. The final thing we'll go through in this video are groups. Groups can be used to display individual sets of nodes and members in isolation from the rest of the model, which can be particularly useful in large models. To demonstrate how to use groups, we'll use the 3D tower example from the desktop again. So to create a group, we have two options. The first and probably the easiest option is to highlight the nodes and members you want in that group so that they are all purple. Then right click, select groups and add from selection. We can then name the group. In this case, we'll call it level four. This will automatically bring us into viewing just this group with the rest of the model displayed as just dashed lines. If we then analyze this model, we can see that just this portion of the model results are shown. This will also apply to deflection. We can set which group we're viewing by clicking the groups drop down at the top. Where in our case, we can just view our level four group or the entire model. Another way to make a group is by clicking the groups button. And then within this menu, we can find the members that we want, highlight all of them, and by clicking new. These groups can also be used as part of print views, but we'll go through this in another video. That about covers the main additional features that come with Analysis Standard. Although Analysis Lite does already have a lot to offer, if you're looking for more customizability or want to create bigger models, then Analysis Standard is a must have. Feel free to check out our website and our other videos for more tutorials and help with using this software. If you have any questions, please contact our support team via email or by calling us. Thanks for watching. Thank you.